All right, Pat's Interference in the Road, Monday night, Orlando, Florida, owners' meetings. Tommy Curran, NBC Sports Boston. You follow him, you listen to him, you watch him. And now you're going to do a little bit of both here. Uh, YouTube, Apple, Spotify, you know the deal now. We have a quick episode here today. There's no 15 off the field. We've got 20 to 25 with Tommy. We have four to five takeaways. I'm going to set a timer. Old school. We're just going to oh, go okay. through it. And I like it. it. Yeah. Uh, but we were just talking off air. Initial impressions because Gerard talks today. He talked for 30 minutes. Mm-hmm. And there was a lot there. There was. There was a lot of meat on the bone. And I think that a couple of the things that I would circle back to and what I wrote about was the fact that he underscored the backbeat to his comments were oftentimes – this is going to be a while. Mm-hmm. You know, this is going to take some time. You need to have patience with us. I don't know how I'm going to do as a head coach. I don't know how Elliot's going to do as a GM. Hopefully, well. Um, everything's about drafting, developing, um, playing the board, or selecting a player. There's very few definitive things because there is so much TBD. And as you know, Gerard pointed out, it is his first time yes. around. It's his first time as a head coach. So. That's where they are. We could talk forever about whether that's where they should be Mm -hmm. and whether they should have opened up a search, but this is where they are. This is what they did. There is a learning curve. There is a complete dearth of talent on the team. In case you missed it, yeah. So, you know, as I said in what I wrote, Rome wasn't built in a day, and it also wasn't crumbled in a day. It took some time for the Patriots to get to this point. It's going to take some time for them to get out. But they're also, to use another geographical reference, Siberia. And that was my other takeaway, is that the Patriots are acknowledging that they are a little bit radioactive for players who might be looking around about where they want to go. Mm. And Calvin really is a good example, Andrew. I talked to... Um, well, let's start the clock, because you're hitting on my first takeaway, which has three sub-bullet points. There's so many little logistical things here that I didn't understand. Go. That's okay. So he had a game plan going here, right? Like, and we could go in and parse words that they tip his hand about the quarterback plan and the draft at number three, and we'll get to that in a bit. I think it's best to understand, like rewatching a game, what was their game plan going in, right? Like that's their mindset. You understand why they said the things after, called the plays they did. When you understand where they started from, then you figure out how they ended up where they did. In my mind, he had three things he wanted to get across. One of which you said already, this is a long rebuild, right? And they need players who are magnets. That's a quote, have some gravity to them. The guys want to come play with them. Um, they're open to offers at number three. And the crafts, which he volunteered five times, have their full have given their full support in spending, in tools, and in investment. No one asked about this stuff, but was something clearly Gerard wanted to get across. Yeah, and I think that still a five-time mention in 30 minutes doesn't outweigh the number of mentions from two to six on Felger and Maz or on um, you know, Jones and Mega. Yeah. From two to six, or any of the other radio shows, or any of our television shows on um NBC Sports Boston. Any that you disagree with, though? Like, he wanted to get those across? No. Did I Did I miss a big one? No, I think he. Okay. those were definite talking points. But I also think he was a game plan coach today in that he understands they're going to try and take me in different directions. I'm going to react to that. And I think, as well as I know him, he is precise and likes to plan, but he also likes to be reactive. Yeah. He doesn't want to over plan and wants to be able to be um, organic. And I think that, you know, he did that to an extent as well. But what I did think was good was he didn't get himself out in the ocean and keep talking and then get himself overboard. He had succinct answers, not deep on the what the details were, but he had succinct answers that he closed the book on and moved to the next thing. But a lot of the answers were TBD. We're not sure. Yeah. Could do this, could do that. And I don't blame him because that's how you have to be when you are dealing with, in some ways, Andrew, a blank slate. So, and let, that brings us to number three, right? Because we're talking about the quarterbacks. Tell us about Drake May. What do you think? No ceiling, right? But also be mindful of the floor. Not as much in Jane Daniels. Oh, and we are considering J.J. McCarthy, who's one of five, including Caleb Williams and Mystery Man, probably Bo Nix. Uh, probably Bo Nix. I think so. They haven't talked to Penix at all. I don't, I don't think they've even, like, looked at this tape on the, the oh, reporting on this. That would be... They've obviously watched this tape, but the point I is they've say, not visited I with him. Not him. I, that would be my choice. But I think as far as the people that they've shown up at Pro Days, okay. the combine visits, et cetera, it's been more Knicks than Penn Knicks. Um, but the point being, what I liked there was unlike when he boxed himself into a corner, we're going to burn some cash. We're going to take a player at a premium position. You put the puzzle pieces together, as he told Steve Burden on his introductory press conference. This was, no, all options are on the table, which he told you and Mike Giardi and Mike Reese. 
yesterday, Sunday when we all got in, but I think was smart because, A, even if you know you're taking a quarterback, just invite the godfather offer to show up at your doorstep anyway. Like, oh, we might do this. We like a lot of quarterbacks. We're, we're open for business. Whereas had he been acting in the same way he had earlier, you know, it's not in the best interest of the team publicly to limit your options, right? You want to have everything on the table and let people know that's how you feel, whether you do or don't. Yeah, and I think that, again, allowing for who he is, and we can have conversations about whether he was ready necessarily for everything that's coming at him. He's seeing 90-mile-an-hour pitching when he's not used to it. He's used to quick slants and zooms. <laughs> how fast is quick slants? I mean, we're throwing 73. Yeah, so like batting, batting cages, like. Responsibility-wise, yeah, it's yeah. He's literally right. in terms of responsibility. Just show up and, and be amusing, and give us some details and right. and information that we don't know. But now he's in charge of a six billion dollar team. So you know, the burn some cash. I, I continue to even if I didn't know the guy, I'd say, you know, I know, and everybody in the market knows the way in which that burn some cash. Those three words were delivered. Were tongue in cheek, as he stood up, joking as, hey, let's be personable in the interview. And he didn't understand that they were going to be used as a cudgel. I think it's disingenuous to continue to use them as a cudgel, mm -hmm. but it ain't going away. That's me. I'm not going to mention the burn some cash stuff because I know the guy was joking. Um, he did say we're going to spend. He's continued to say we're going to spend. But burn some cash is going to be affixed to his epitaph until the Patriots succeed. And that's, and that's not even all his fault, though, right? Like, he he made a mistake, but it's amplified by the history and the lack of spending over the last 10 years, which is not to assign blame Bill or Kraft or even get into that conversation. It's just saying the situation he stepped into was more sensitive when it came to spending. And then when he delivers the news everyone's wanted to hear for so long, and then they're not following through. Yeah, because he's not attuned to the conversation right. in the market because he's been a linebacker's coach slash de facto defensive coordinator. So he's not listening to the conversation about when are they going to spend. Yeah. And again, the, the conversation has, to me, so drastically pivoted to the crafts are the ones who don't spend from Bill having been the one right. that it is stupefying. I mean, how many times can they say, we never told Bill he couldn't spend? What they had in Bill was a head coach who might have been tighter with a buck than they are, yeah. which was a dream come friggin' true. I mean, Bill wasn't not paying DeAndre Hopkins because Robert Kraft didn't say not to. He wasn't paying DeAndre Hopkins because he didn't want to pay um, a wide receiver who only practiced sometimes and he thought it might be over the hill. And he thought he was good enough to play without him. They had Devontae Parker. Who thought they, they could do fine with $22.5 million against the cap for Tom Brady. Yeah. Um, this is all we can do in 2020. We're going to move on from a guy who can go and walk in eight months later and win a Super Bowl or whatever it was in Tampa Bay. But we don't want you because $22.5 million on the cap is as we go. Yeah. All right. Time's up. Next point. And this uh, brings us to a place where you are on one side of the bridge and I'm on the other. Mm -hmm. The situation, whether to draft the quarterback. But it's not so much where you stand on that bridge. It's that Gerard Mayo says a quarterback can, can walk across here because, quote, he feels it's 100 percent ready, the roster and the staff to support a rookie quarterback. His comments after that mostly pointed to the staff, and he's it's not lost on him that like their their offensive roster is what it is. Because when he was then asked, "Hey, who's going to start at left tackle?" He's like, uh, "Well, you know, we uh, signed uh, Chucks over there. Now we'll kind of see. He might be on one end. He might be right tackle." And like that's again the roster he has. Um, but it's interesting to me that he was confident we can address quarterback, receiver, and left tackle in the draft as something we have to do in the first place. But also we're confident enough to bring that quarterback into what obviously is a situation. I don't think anyone else is saying. Yeah, they're ready to bring in a kid. I don't think any – I think most people are lobbying for them to bring in a kid. So you have to be ready. Yeah. Well, so, ready how then? I mean, the roster – Well, they're not going to sit there and say – they're. I'm telling them my opinion is they are not ready to bring in a quarterback because they're so bad they're going to have to sit them. They're not going to have the time to bring them up to speed. They're going to be behind a learning curve. And as a result, you're going to waste the one year of his rookie contract. We can go further on on all that, but people think the Patriots are ready, and I don't see how Gerard Mayo could sit at a conference press conference today and say we're not ready to support a quarterback. He has to say that. Well, what he could say is a version of what Bill often said, right? And this isn't too. Are you ready to support a quarterback? What are you? Gonna the say? roster today is not the roster we're going to have at the start of training camp. We'll find out when we get there. We're planning to improve. We're always looking to get better. Trades for agency in the draft. We're a month away from the draft. We could make some trades. We might sign some players. And he said some version of that, right? Like right. he intends to explore all three avenues to roster building. In my mind, especially the premium positions, two are generally block blocked off, like receivers, corners for the most part, quarterbacks certainly don't hit for agency. 
you're not trading them unless you're taking on a large salary and that's some sort of defect in the product. So then it's just the draft. But then you're asking all of these kids, not just the quarterback, but the receivers and the left tackle to come in and start all together. Like that's that's the tough part. Well, I think the support he's talking about when he does talk about the coaching, can you support it? Then he's going to look at it and say, well, yeah, I mean, we have players at these positions. Is it going to be as well orchestrated and supportive to this position as it is, say, in Philadelphia? For Jalen Hurts, yeah. who's a middle league quarterback, generally speaking, but had an MVP season a couple of years ago because he had an unbelievable support. No, it's not. Well, we're going to have humans at those spots. <laughs> so, of course, we're going to say we could support it. But to me, the larger conversation at number three is they're not good enough. And the only way to get good enough is to use this once in a lifetime or once in a generation, more, ac- more accurately, um, third overall pick. To turn that into multiple picks, which would be, say, for instance, with Minnesota, you get 11, you get your tackle, you get 23, you get your wide receiver. Then next year, you have two first round picks, your own. You're probably still not a great team because you had Jacoby Brissett and whoever else fell off the quarterback tree. Now you're in the top 10 again, most likely, which is what a build will be. You have that pick in whatever Minnesota has for next year because Minnesota had to give up another number one for next year, which is what the asking price will be. So now you have those four picks to address those positions and you have mobility with your two first round picks to do what Minnesota's doing. You go up and you get the quarterback who turned out to be Jaden Daniels. That everybody's turned their note, you know, says, Oh, it's not going to happen next year. What were they saying about Jaden Daniels in August? Not much. Now he's the second overall pick. That quarterback will materialize. You give yourself the opportunity to move up and you don't waste a year of a rookie contract with Drake May who needs polishing. I'm not saying it's Drake May's fault, He's a good player, and if he goes to Minnesota and he has a four-touchdown game, he wouldn't have done that here. It's a new era, not just for the Patriots, but for the Pats Interference Podcast, brought to you now by Prize Picks, the largest daily fantasy sports platform in America. I'm making player picks, watching the Celtics, points, rebounds, and I get to test my skills like you can on Prize Picks this season because it's the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. If you have the skills, you can turn 10 bucks into 250 bucks with just a few taps and then here's the best part quick withdrawals easy gameplay an enormous selection of players and stat types which all make prize picks the number one daily fantasy sports app plus a review policy which means you get your money back in case of injury the only dfs platform to offer an insurance policy Again, Prize Picks has been a ton of fun with the Celtics. You can also go with the Bruins, any number of different sports, games, players, plays, and options. So right now, go to prizepicks.com slash CLNS and use code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, that's prizepicks.com slash CLNS and use code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Well, let's go back to Mayo because it's interesting. Your pal of mine, Mike Jordan, texted me. was like, hey, what, do you, what, was your, what was your vibe today? I don't think Mike knows how to use the word vibe. What was your read on Mayo today as far as the quarterbacks go? And I, I said, I think he said everything that you would want to say if you're trying to induce a godfather off or understanding where I come from. And that was a very compelling case. You have me moving a little bit closer to your side on this. I would just say you're not in this spot again. There's an excellent quarterback class. Like that, we were saying at the end of 2022, Caleb Williams, Drake may take him. Do you think whether Gerard and Elliott, and Elliott's really making the call, if we're being honest, tip their hand in any kind of way as to being closer to the case you're making or the, the way I feel? I think they're edging closer to where I am. And I think okay. that I don't think that I haven't been told that, and I have got no indications they are, but I think the default the default continues to be quarterback. Yeah. Publicly. Privately, no matter how you slice it, the Patriots believe having a good quarterback and a good coach is the way to get back where they were. It's the truth. To a degree, it is. To a degree, it is. The truth, as I read Andrew's well-researched and well-done article that was uh, on the Her- in the Herald the other day, is people don't understand where franchise quarterbacks come from. Because as, as Andrew wrote, you, know, you have to find a top five quarterback to get there. And then Andrew... He's been waiting for this. <laughs> used his examples of franchise quarterbacks, Patrick Mahomes, Lamar Jackson, and I can't remember the other one. Josh Allen, Joe Josh Burrow. Allen. And I'm like, hey, you didn't mention Joe Burrow in this sentence. And I'm like, hey, that's the 32nd overall pick. 
the tenth overall pick and the seventh overall pick going to a playoff. Team. Burrow was definitely in there because I cited okay. T. Higgins later. That so we, we got Don't three, me on that. three top ten His picks point. in there. You said top five in the story. Okay. You said top. you don't find them unless you go top five. And none of the guys he mentioned, Jackson, <laughs> Mahomes, or Josh Allen were top five picks. And I'm like, Andrew, you're making my point. Listen, I wrote a story which was even more compelling than his. I don't care what the oh. time clock says. Well, hold on. because I, I My story going. was even more compelling. You go back to 1998. You know how many quarterbacks have won a Super Bowl who were taken on the top three? Two, Eli and Peyton. So anybody named Manning taken on the top three of the draft, they don't win Super Bowls. Stafford, you say? Well, he didn't win it, but he's in the draft. Today. So he's out. He oh, go. now he's out. Well, he's definitely out. He didn't win it with the team. The Patriots aren't drafting guy number three to go win a Super Bowl with Jacksonville. They would be drafting him, as the Lions did, to win a Super Bowl with them and Stafford. So it doesn't happen. You are just as likely because your situation and your team sucks to ruin the guy as you are to get benefit from him. So you might get Cam Newton. You might get Matt Bryan. You might get, oh, uh, you name it. Uh, look, Rex Grossman was a first-round pick. He made it to a Super Bowl. But Colin Kaepernick made it to a Super Bowl. He was a second-round pick. Here's the Russell thing. I, Wilson I think what we're getting at here is, is a bar. The situation that, matters more than top three pick. We could quibble about three, five, or ten. The point is the only reliable place on planet Earth, which I've said here too many times, drink if you're listening at home. It is in that top ten. No, it is. It okay, is. It is ten. Now you're ten. ten. Right, but here's the thing. Well, this where is, are this the top is, ten quarterbacks who've won Super Bowls? If the bar is to win a Super Bowl, there are only what forty high thirty number of quarterbacks we've ever done that. I don't think the goal here, obviously, it's Super Bowl, but it's regular sustained convention. So CJ Stroud, you're good with because that's you know that's. Good yeah, am I good with CJ Stroud? Absolutely. Okay, Did you but, see but, him play this you, year? Yeah, but understand that CJ Stroud or Justin Herbert, who people are excited about. Yes, that's Justin you Herbert's. He's, He's uh, one and one in the playoffs, or oh, one. No, Trevor Lawrence is one and one in the playoffs. First overall pick. Um, generally speaking, your team sucks, and even if it doesn't suck, which Justin Herbert's doesn't, and he was taken sixth overall, he was littered. His offense was with talented offensive players. Eckler, Mike Williams. But Keenan you know Ed. that's not the full equation, right? Like we heard it from Gerard here today, not. right? It's because defense, he, special teams, coaching, the situation you're talking about. My so you, if you don't have those, you don't take the quarterback. You can't wait to build the house and the driveway and pave the driveway and the garage and then get the car. Oh, really? I because think, the Chiefs did, and the Chiefs are the best team in football. Okay, they thought they had their quarterback. Let's stay here, though. because no, no. This is No, this is a simple causation versus correlation. I don't think it's the fact that these guys were picked in the first three or top five that made you them they have fail. They have to use a top five or top ten pick on a quarterback. Let's stay with top ten, then. That's fine. But my point is they're at three. And your best chance of getting a quarterback is to stay there and take one. And if you do not fail him, which is also partly their choice, and I think they failed in the process of supporting him, right? Not getting Calvin Ridley. They could execute trades later on. It's not simply that once you were picked at three or five or whatever, you're fated then to never win a Super Bowl. That's the correlation part. The causation, obviously, is the situation. I'm saying you need to get him in now. You can protect him. Let Jacoby take the hits in the meantime, which would stunt his development. But... Drake May and Caleb Williams have been known for almost two years to be guys that you can build a franchise around, right? And we've seen the impact. <laughs> well, that's what people think. Right. But that's as sure that's as close as you can get at this point. And so I think it's so unless you have, I would say Jaden Daniels or Caleb Williams, I would bet on because they are tides that can lift all boats. I would be more um, amenable to either of those guys if the Patriots had an opportunity to take them. Oh, because you're out on May, yeah. No, out on May is an overstatement. It's a 21-year-old kid who has a lot of sloppy techniques. I don't think when I watched him this past year, and I know it was well, a I know. We talked about paint, by numbers, paint yeah. by numbers operation for him. He's just kind of doesn't do a lot of pre-snap reading, and that's the way their offense was. But you're going to ask a lot of him, and you're going to put him in a situation similar to, not identical to, similar to Mac Jones, where you're going to say, play well, be smart. Make good decisions, which Mayo said was the number one thing. But do it when it's a jailbreak. And that's how you retire the progress of a player. Again, oh, Jalen Hurts. Why is Jalen Hurts good? Because he's got A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith. Well, he, he's he, got an offensive line. He's also got a good skill set. Like, this is giving – think He's not two, nearly as accurate as Mac Jones. I think he is. Okay, you're wrong. But No, it's, it's in numbers. We can go to adjusting completion you, percentage, average depth of target, go all the way down. But people don't want to care about Mac but, Jones but, or hear but, about them. Okay, but Jalen I'm Hurts. saying – 
Jalen Hurts is an okay quarterback. I'd like he's, top top, he's a top dozen. Perfect. Top dozen guy. First time we've agreed on the number tonight. Uh, so fine. But to get top dozen performance or even runner-up MVP performance from him, which is what he was, if you surround him with so much, here's the thing. Boom. Here's you turbocharge him. They've already screwed up in free agency. Right. So once that happens, you have to start. Oh, okay, we didn't get a wide receiver. They have to start moving to finding ways to get receivers. So that I'm saying that the free agency fails move them even further away from being supportive enough for a, a, a top five, top three pick. The most salient point is this on my end. If not now, when I'm not willing to bet on the most important part of a franchise over the coach over the owner, over everything. This is the number one option in the NBA, where you know, same thing, top 10 is the most reliable only place on planet Earth to find an impact number one on a championship team. But the point stands, nonetheless, the power of the quarterback. I'm not waiting on a guy that I know I can get, whether it's Shane Daniels or Drake May, and multiple people in their front office believe in those guys. Sources have told my good colleague, Doug Guy, to to just wait and think, if not now, because it's not going to be free agency, it's not going to be via trade, you're saying Jane Daniels will just pop up next year. And that happened with Joe Burrow four years ago. I don't know how many quarterbacks besides him and maybe Jane Daniels, who could be a failure, right, that we just count on to pop up because you're already locking him in as a success. And I think to wait for the most important part as opposed to lock that in first, then build around him, develop him in a way that you support. You have Jacoby in the meantime to take those hits. It's one year of a rookie contract versus one year wasted for everyone else on the roster because you just weren't ready to roll it out with the kid. I know. I, I, you're I, not going to. There's no guarantee to trade back up into three. And if you do, you have two extra first round picks. You're just giving them back up to move back up, and that's it. You don't know. You're being sarcastic and not even a prick right now. Because, because you know, say for instance, you you take a chance on a Trey Lance. And he doesn't work out. And you take a chance on a Carson Wentz. He doesn't work. Well, where are you then? You're in the Super Bowl because the rest of your team is so good that you can get to the Super Bowl with Jalen Hurts or Brock Purdy or Jimmy Garoppolo because your team is that good. So you built There's no guarantee that Elliot Wolf is going to be the same GM as Howie Roseman, the best GM in football going on 10 to 12 points, sense. or John Lynch. Not at all. John Lynch was a player. God bless him. He's done a great job. But John Lynch was nobody's idea of the next coming of – And where is your offensive line? Are you suddenly going to fill you up those four spots? Who's your offensive coordinator? You're talking about Kyle it. Shanahan. You're talking about uh, Doug Peterson for a time, Nick Sirianni. You're frantic for a guy who's on solid ground. I, I think am. you know your ground is shaking. This is this is bad news. Uh, news news for uh, I, BNC later. This is, I mean, oh, well, it's the missus, but I'm going to ask you. Actually, we have to wait. That's not yeah, good. we'll give her five. We'll give um, five more minutes. I mean, I've just made airtight point after airtight point against you. You have not though. Like the the ultimate outliers You're are the Niners about the how Eagles. I mean, it's only two of them. I mean, let's go to Kansas City. That's a team that was picking 28th overall. That moved up to get a quarterback I know in the top what they 10. did. I'm explaining it to people because that's the point. You wait for the quarterback to fall off the quarterback tree, and the rest of the team will take care of it. That's how it works. It doesn't work by taking Sam Darnold. It doesn't work by taking Zach Wilson. It doesn't work by taking Trey Lance or Mac Jones or Justin Fields or anybody else. And you're so scared of just sitting him for a year. When you have a fifth-year oh, option a to pick no, up down a, the road. it's a waste because it's the most expensive position. I would rather pick up my fifth-year option on the wideout that I take this year. Roman Dunze or whoever else will be gone at 11 most likely. But um, I would rather pick up the fifth-year option on him and keep him around for Quinn Ewers if he turns into the next genius quarterback. So you're that, that sure that you're getting a potential franchise quarterback, of which they may be no, none next year. You don't year. need a quote-unquote franchise quarterback you make them by the rest of the franchise being really good this is a guy russell who Wilson. covered tom brady for 20 years yeah and said and it's the rest of the team that because, powers because them, not the I, quarterback because when i watched tom brady i had spent my first four years on the beat watching a number one overall pick get worse and worse and worse and then i watched the sixth round pick come in and lift all boats as Brady did, despite the resistance to the notion that he was good in 2001, that the Patriots... Why are you looking at me like I wasn't 12 <laughs> at that time saying that he wasn't good? <laughs> like it was my fault people are saying he wasn't good. Who? Brady? No, Brady. because you bristled to someone. Well, well I'm talking about the last 10 years the, that we all watched. But I watched the number one pick. Use Tom Brady as an example. No, we can't. No, the use Tom Brady as an example. No, no, no. Use Tom Brady as an example. 
as an example for a team that had a player parachute in and win a Super Bowl immediately oh, because stop. of the quarterback because they – what do you mean stop? You think if Tom Brady stayed in New England, he was winning a Super Bowl in, 20, in 2020? So we just went from 2001 think, to 2020? No, no I'm no, using no, no, an no, example no. of a player going to a situation that causes the situation to improve exponentially. And it's a veteran player going to a good situation. Tampa won a Super Bowl because they had an infrastructure in place that only needed Brady. The Patriots are not in a situation where all they that's, need is that's, great men. That's not – I agree. I agree. This is, this is how it works, but I but swear to God. I'm that's not... the point that you're making for me, is that that was a 7-9, and 8-18. Eight and 18. And what changed it was not the infrastructure. It wasn't the talent already there. It, it was, Mike the, Evans it was the quarterback Sparkle. who came and powered the rest of it. So they should have taken Jameis Winston? Is Jameis the pick? Yeah, Jameis Winston. Jameis was still there. How'd they do with Jameis? They took him number one. The idea, How they deal with Jameis? They took him number we one. We all know how Jameis Winston was. To me, that's not evidence that if you were taken in the top three, you're fated so to stop. So he didn't develop. Obviously, you're not going into a great the situation. What happened Sam Bradford taking number one overall? They want How about any senior. quarterback aside from Dak Prescott or anyone Russell after the Wilson? first round? Russell Wilson won a, won a Super Bowl. Went to 2012? Two went to two of them. Yeah. 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 Who was he taking? Second round? 2012, second and round then guy? Dak in 2016. Second round. If you like those odds better than the guys in the top 10, that's 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 know. good. You build your team. You can drop in a Brock Purdy and oh, do it with a straight face. Build we were, the we, team. We were talking about Drod Mayo. We went completely off the rails. I'm trying to help you. It's not happening. No, well, we're going to be talking about first round quarterback draft picks again in 2027. <laughs> we, I, I hope not. I'm I'm desperate for good offense. Uh, final takeaway before we let you go about Drod. And just what you heard today, and and what do you think it means? Um, I would take say my other takeaway is that Elliot Wolf is not a silo, but he is a corp. He is the personnel corporation CEO. I think that that yeah. is very very clear. Um, and I think that if Mayo could say it, uh, he would say it. And that is, he gets the players. I coach the players. I'll give my input on what I like and what I don't like, but at the end of the day, I'm going to defer to him on what he and the scouts think of the quarterback. If they think, for all this conversation again, if they think that Drake May can be worked with and Alex Van Pelt thinks he can be worked with and Ben McAdoo thinks that. I think they do. Then they will they'll select the player. And if somebody walks up to them and says, we're going to give you two first-round picks, swap and we'll give you another one next year they should think long and hard about it because they can drastically improve their entire team and then wait for the quarterback to fall off the quarterback tree because there is a quarterback tree so the the last part i want to leave from from drop we should have shared more of his words rather than ours but because he just he just talked today it was a big 30 minutes the only guaranteed way to win is to accumulate more picks now as someone who is firmly in the draft the quarterback at three camp if not now when or how i actually like this from him because it aligned with everything that we know analytically aaron shots football outside formerly football outsider said this in the podcast this is the way bill operated no one is that much better at drafting players than anybody else mm -hmm. it's largely random okay even with all the data the research the scouting etc so you might as well have more bites of the apple throw more darts pick your cliche uh analogy at the draft to increase your likelihood of hitting on those players. I'm glad to hear that from Drod, understanding at least personally some of the other things he said are not necessarily aligned analytically, which I'm not strictly follow the numbers guy, but use the tools if you have them and you know how to use them. I, I, I appreciated him saying that uh, because I think it's a smarter way to roster build. I 1 million percent agree. And <laughs> <basically, you might. laughs> I mean, the logic, the logic behind drafting a quarterback at number three, regardless, and that tends, it's, I feel like it's tending that way because the argument is, when are you going to be up there again? The argument for doing that is, is somewhat devoid of just plain logic in that because you're just saying, you're at three, take a quarterback. We're not saying this guy is a franchise quarterback. This guy individually will be better for our team than – one of the best tackles and one of the best receivers and another top 10 player next year because they can use that. So that's what you're saying when you take them at number three. And I think three will beat one, especially if there are question marks around the one. Yeah. I mean, look, 
I think let's assume all the players hit, right? And we understand these are bets with certain percentages of whether they hit or not based on their fit, development, skill set, all of that stuff. The quarterback hitting in a way that the upside is typically offered in the top, whatever, is higher than if the left tackle and the receiver hit combined. Nope. Yes. Nope. Yes. If you use AV, approximate value from pro football reference, and add up the quarterback. What's the first word of that that metric? Approximate value. Approximate, yeah. It, it's as rough as they're it all I used it and, and cited it myself. The point but is, it's also, very, very, there's very also reliable. You're not letting me finish. Okay, go ahead. You're right. No, I lost my train of thoughts because I'd be yelling at them. I'm not letting me finish. Approximate value. They're all rough. Tackle and receiver is worth more than a quarterback who oh, yeah. reaches. Well, here's the interesting thing with a quarterback, with Trevor Lawrence, for instance, or even CJ Stroud to an extent. You often have to squint to see the potential that still exists. I mean, you're going into your fourth year of Trevor Lawrence, and you're like, he is he's good. He is good. Justin Herbert, he's good. He's good. And they are good. Top 10 guys. They are, which is why they were taken in the top 10. Mm -hmm. But there are barriers to their success. In Justin Herbert's case, it's been offensive line and coaching. In Trevor Lawrence's case, it was coaching. And urban life, or, yeah, it, coaching and you know, losing your development. In you have that, a franchise curse, and then the most bumble, like the yeah. worst recent head coach in NFL history. So, again, you're going to a difficult situation. We can both agree that Gerard Mayo was on a massive learning curve. Yeah, the Patriots did not intend to fire Bill Belichick when they entered the 2023 season. They never imagined four and 13, they never imagined moving on from Bill. They never imagined their team under Bill getting this bad. And I don't think anyone did. No, we did not. Even even as the Patriots were playing in ways in 2022 that you'd say that's not a Bill Belichick team, you still never thought that they would lose that many games. No. But they did. They found a way. Um, so there's a massive learning curve here that I think, again, is when you look in hindsight in 2028, if the quarterback they take, you'll say, even if the guy's working out, even if Gerard Mayo is still here, we'll look back and say, that was a rocky first year for Drake. Mm. God bless him. He was able to get through it. Good thing he had that metal and the grit and the leadership that are arguing for his being selected right now. And that's all that Elliot and Gerard are talking about, right? Like yep. that, that, that moxie, that leadership, that toughness. It was the first thing Elliot said of the all best, these guys. That might be the best thing that helps the Patriots selecting at three is that it seems like the best leaders and most vocal leaders are McCarthy and Met. Daniels is a little more quiet. Caleb Williams is a little bit divisive, seemingly. So this what we've seen. Yeah. So this might argue more. These are two players. We talk about magnets. They want to be here. I don't think Jaden Daniels necessarily wants to be here. I don't think so either. Although that sounded very close to magnets. Magnets. You guys bring oh, yeah. players with them. So. Uh, <laughs> steep learning curve. Agree. Uh, less frantic now. Feeling better. Feet on the ground. I think we need a beer. Cocktail party. A little bit later here at the JW. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I have to work. Sorry if I yelled Early at your guy. Sorry if I yelled at your host. No, it's okay. It him. makes more fun. Some of the sickos like that, I think, a little bit more. Um, yeah, lots to learn from Gerard today. I thought it was good. The learning curve is edit evident. I think he is learning. I learned. Already. I taught the guy too, didn't I? You did. You taught a lot of people. No. I put myself in your quarterback tree. Did, just TV wait tree? by the tree; it will fall. The quarterback <laughs> will fall out. It might be a Purdy. It might be a Hertz. I love all of these anecdotal outliers. He's Tommy Kern. I'm Andrew Callahan. We are in the basement of a JW Marriott and a conference room we should no longer be, so we are going to leave. Thank you for listening. I'll be back later this week. The Ringers' Danny Kelly, the Ringers' Danny Heifetz, a three-person draft roundtable. We are going to talk some quarterbacks later this week.